Hello there, it's me, Stephen Thomas, with another housing debrief. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, really quick, just wanted to get into what's going on in the market within the last week. Uh, there's been a major change in the real estate industry, and we're seeing it uh, affect the number of pending sales. Everybody's trying to put together these transactions, and there's just a new way of doing business. This is going to monkey with the data for the next uh, few weeks, and then it'll iron itself out. Because uh, there's a statistic, it's like 72% uh, of, of uh, all real estate agents, something I recently saw, it's like business as usual. But for a number of agents out there still, there are a number of agents, 28%, that uh, still are having a little bit of an issue with this new change. So it's affecting uh, it, all the metrics. So you got to take everything with a grain of salt because what it's showing right now is inventory is continuing to grow slightly. It looks like it's about to peak and demand is dropping on a weekly basis. Uh, interest rates are actually improving. So with, with uh, interest rates continuing to improve and the Fed set to be cutting rates, you're going to see an improvement in the overall uh, demand readings not continuing to go down like it is right now. So the market's continuing to slow a bit right now, and this is just has a lot to do with the, the new industry standards that they have been uh, doing now for nearly three weeks. So let's just get it right into the uh, today's topic, and that is, is the housing bubble about to pop? And I'm talking about this slowdown that we're having, and this slowdown uh, illustrates you know, things are not as fast as they were before, but does that mean that the uh, market is going to pop? And let's get into it. And I'm going to show you, this is the Freddie Mac House Price Index for the United States. And the this is uh, what values have done over time. It's a real good home price index. It's not median sales. I'm not a big giant fan of median sales. And you can see what's happened here is over time, we've seen uh, values that have risen really fast. And this dates all the way back to the uh, mid-70s. And you can see this right here is prior to the Great Recession from 2000 to 2007 when things peaked and then values came down. And, of course, there is what uh, everybody remembers. And, well, this is 2012 through about 2020. And values were going up not quite at the same clip that they were prior to the Great Recession. But slowly but surely, year over year, values are going up about 5% to 6% per annum. There's a couple of years where it was a bit higher across the United States. Then along came COVID, and we got this giant rise, and that's where we are right now today. So there's a big rise in home values from where they, they were in 2020. But um, I, in, in looking at this, uh, you, I, I wanted to go over uh, how much values went up. You can't really tell on the very left-hand side when you get to the 70s. This started, this Freddie Mac House Price Index in 1975. In 1975. And from 1975 to 1980, actually values went up 75%. And from 1980 to 1990, values went up 67%. And from 90 to the year 2000, values went up 38%. In, from 2000 to 2006, right prior to the Great Recession, values went up 71%. Then, but if you look, if you just look at 2000 to 2010, uh, because of the Great Recession, values coming down, you actually overall had values go up 35% during that decade. From 2010 to 2020, values went up 55%. And from 2020 to 2024, values have gone up 47%. And people are going, man, values just keep on going up. They've gone up so much in, uh, since, uh, recent, in, in recent times. But this is going to stretch out over time. It's very hard to see values come down. I know that people talk about cycles in the real estate all the time. I've heard 10 years. I've heard 20 years. That's not quite what we have. And when you look at it, uh, this I'm pointing here to 1980, uh, in the early 80s. So this is right around 1982. And you can see values came back in, in 1982. Now, you really can't see this because this is so many years and so many months. There are some months where it comes down for a few months, especially towards the end of the year. And in the 1990s, in some areas like where we are in Orange County in Southern California, we noticed values come down quite a bit in the 1990s. It doesn't reflect this in the 
the in the United States. And what we're pointing to in the middle there, or t uh, almost uh, two thirds of the way along, you'll see the Great Recession where values came down. Now on the very right hand side, you see that values came down in 2022 a little bit, and that was the absorption of interest rates climbing so fast from three and a quarter percent all the way to 7.37 percent by October of 2022. And uh, we actually had values come down for the second half of the year of 2022 because of the the giant disruption in uh, values, uh, home values being so high, and then you plug in these different interest rates. We're not used to seeing these wild swings in interest rates where interest rates more than doubled from where they uh, started the year. That's not typical. And when that happens, everything gets all gummed up and everything really slows down. But since then, there, it's been it's been strange because rates have not come down that much, but because rates have stabilized, we've actually seen values go up a little bit. Where we're at right now, we're probably going to see flat values for the rest of the year, but that's not what we forecast is going to happen in 2025, and we'll get to our forecast for 2025 uh, on on a later uh, broadcast. But everybody tells me in their gut, I hear this all the time that values just need to come down. Values just need to come down. They say it over and over again, like as if if they say it enough, it'll come down. My gut tells me that it should go down. Things are so unaffordable and people can't really afford to, to, to purchase. And there's so many grandparents and, and, and uncles and aunts and moms and dads that are co-signing and giving gobs of money to their children or grandchildren to so that they could uh, uh, be able to purchase a home. So it just it, this can't keep on going. And they're right. It can't keep on going. There is a absolute solution to this, and I will talk about it. And uh, but we're, we got to go further into this podcast, podcast to uh, podcast. I don't even do a podcast. <laughs> this broadcast in order to to uh, illustrate what's going on. And this is the national payment to income ratio that's done by ICE, which was formerly Black Knight. And you can see it's right now at thirty four point three percent is is what is the national uh, median income. And uh, that's the na national median income and the payment uh, ratio. If you look at how much they're making on a monthly pay, uh, monthly basis for the national median income, and if they were to afford the median sales price home today that is available across the United States, 34.3% of their income is devoted to that monthly payment. In a lot of areas, it's a lot higher, especially here in Southern California where values are uh, uh, are, are so high. and uh, But if you look at 34.3% and we draw a line across, it's actually higher than uh, where we were during the uh, Great Recession. And you have, it dials it all the way back to the 1980s. Uh, so that's the last time we had this uh, unaffordability uh, across the United States at the level that we have right now. It's very, very, very close to the uh, peak time of the uh, Great Recession, the Great Financial Crisis, right there around uh, 2007, 2008. So uh, there are three things that go into affordability. And that's really what everybody's talking about is affordability. And the three ingredients to affordability are, are uh, values. And the only way to fix this so that things are more affordable are values to come crashing down or for incomes to just all, absolutely skyrocket all of a sudden or for mortgage rates to drop uh, considerably from where they are today. Now, as far as incomes are concerned, incomes have been relatively, uh, they continue to go up at a relatively even rate year over year over year. There are some anomalies, th that being of the uh, Great Recession. And uh, you can see recessions typically impact the uh, income per capita ratio. That's what this is. And uh, you could, uh, the income per capita. And you can actually see on here that there's a bump. Uh, if I zoom it in, you could see it even, even better uh, right after the start of COVID. And that were, were those, that's where uh, there was stimulus packages that were given to Americans across the United States. So that's why there was a bump all of a sudden in pers personal income per capita because of the, the uh, stimulus packages. But it continues to go up at a methodical rate. So we're not, it's, it's not like we're going to all of a sudden see a spike. That's not where this is going to come from as a fix. The other thing is property prices, property values. Oh, but they need to crash. And that's what everybody knows, that income's only going up at a certain rate, so we need to have 
the uh, property values come down so that they are able to purchase. I've heard some people say it needs to come all the way back to 2012 levels. And I've even seen some podcasts of some real perma, perma bears who are laughing at the fact that they're called perma bears, but they've been talking about the market is going to be, it's the biggest bubble of all time. And I'm not even going to mention who these people are, but I will say that they've been saying this since 2010. So, and they, and they renew this and they re up it every single year. So that they're like a broken record. So if you're going to say the same thing for 14 straight years, yes, you do have an issue. You are a perma bear because there's a lot of people that missed out on a lot of equity by listening to to you, especially since 2012. So property prices aren't all of a sudden going to cave. That's not what is is going to happen. And I'll explain why. A lot of people think and they remember what happened in the Great Recession. You know, when values got so high that, uh uh-oh, this thing's going to implode. It has to implode. And it imploded it wasn't necessarily because values were so high. It's, it has to do with the uh, supply and demand. All of a sudden, demand shut down completely and supply boomed. And that's not what we have today. People remember the burn of the Great Recession. That's why it's brought up over and over and over again as to why we're, we, the market should crash. Values should come uh, tumbling down. That value asset, uh, the, uh, the asset bubble of home values should pop and values should come back to where they were before. And I hear a lot of people say they should come all the way back down to 2019 levels is where they should be or the start of 2020 prior to the pandemic. And so, but this is not the Great Recession where we are at right now. Yes, we're actually experiencing a slowdown right now, but it's not the garden variety issue of like a major, major meltdown in the financial uh, institutions, not only in the United States, but around the world, like what happened during the Great Depression and what happened during the Great Financial Crisis. Uh, crisis, also known as the Great Recession. So, uh, but first, before we get into it further, I'd like to bring in our sponsor. Our sponsor is Mike Grambau from JMJ Financial. And you can contact Mike at 714-794-7668. He's a mortgage advisor with the uh, Thibodeau Morell Group at JMJ Financial. And uh, they they know he knows every uh, anybody that's a professional knows that interest rates are going to drop and when interest rates drop all of a sudden demand is going to pick up and we have we see pathways for interest rates to come all the way down to uh down the road even below 5% and we'll get into that in a minute. But when interest rates continue to fall it's going to create more demand and there's a limited supply so offers are going to need to stand out. And what he's all about is finding ways to purchase homes non-contingent on selling a current residence it will become increasingly important. So he wants to help your clients and anybody out there find a way to purchase homes non-contingent on selling their current home. And uh, this is going to be very, very important to really establish a really strong offer. And there are ways and pathways to do this. Mike Grambau is able to consult with clients to find the best means possible to write competitive offers and get those offers uh, accepted. And he has temporary solutions for long-term goals. And there there are uh, different programs that are out there, and, and he knows them best, way better than, than uh, somebody like me. I'm an economist, a housing analyst, but he knows inside and out bridge loans, buy before you sell, and cross-collateral loans. There's non-QM loans. He's got a myriad of products that he'll be able to plug in for your client based upon their individual needs. So contact Mike at uh, JMJ Financial with the Thibodeau Morell Group. Uh, You can contact him directly at 714-794-7668. That's 714-794-7668. Thanks, Mike, for your continued sponsorship. But now back to the program where it is not, this is not a great recession, uh, what's about to take place. And I know that that's what so many people are rooting for because so many people actually think it's a bubble. So many people think it's going to be a crash. It's like two thirds of of, uh, millennials and Generation Z think that the market it it's going to crash and that's going to be their pathway to purchasing and uh, i understand that but there's something else that they could be rooting for but let me explain why it's not the great recession and that is you got a total housing in, uh, uh, inventory right now this is 
this is actually released. And I go over this all the time because it's very important for you to look at this because this goes back to July 1982. And it's just the, the number of homes that are on the market. And we're about a little one, over 1.3 million homes on the right hand side. And we're going to compare that to the supply glut that we experienced over here at, at, at right around started in 2006, then uh, continued in 2007 and 2008, where there were uh, nearly, and it even touched 4 million homes across the United States. Remember, I just told you a little over 1.3 million is where we're at right now. And we are about to peak across the United States in terms of inventory. You can already see it peaking out when we're looking at uh, national inventory numbers. That's what's going on currently right now. That supply glut can be compared to the supply scarcity right now. That supply is supply and demand. There's way too much supply so the uh, back uh, prior to the Great Recession and during the Great Recession, where values had to come down in order to get homes sold and people were desperate, had to sell their homes. And there were foreclosures and short sales where the banks had to sell these assets and they were going to sell these assets. So the only way to make their pro property stand out was by price. So you compare the supply glut. Uh, during the Great Recession to the supply scarcity that we're, that we're dealing with right now. Yes, inventory levels are way higher than where they were last year, but last year kind of established this real bottom. It was not a good year for inventory. As a matter of fact, inventory, uh, it doesn't normally do this, but inventory continued to fall from the start of the year all the way through April, and that is not normal. So we have a supply scarcity problem that's been around since the uh, since the start of COVID, and it really has not fixed itself. There are a few markets that are right there prior to where they were prior to COVID, and you, you can see that in Texas and in Florida, like in, and in Idaho. But that's not what's common across the United States. Still far short of where they were prior to the Great Recession. I mean, prior to COVID, and so it really becomes a demand and supply issue, and that's kind of where we're at right now. So it, it what we're dealing with is a very very low supply. And it is uh, being matched up against a very, very low demand. So if you have a lot of supply matched up against very, very low demand, like we did during the Great Recession, well, that totally favors buyers. And it was so in favor of buyers that values actually plunged. Now, today, we have limited supply and limited demand, and they kind of wash each other out. As a matter of fact, the supply has been such a limited resource that it's actually allowed values to continue to climb even this year and last year with very, very high rates. So if you, that's, that's one portion of it is supply and demand, and we just went into where uh, the supply is. And now we're going to talk about the purchase application, which you can kind of, this translates a little bit to demand, but it also talks about how easy it was to get a loan uh, prior to the great financial crisis. And prior to the great financial crisis, you can actually see that, that, uh, that, there were more and more people that were trying to apply for mortgages across the United States. This is purchase applications. It absolutely was spiking all the way uh, until we, we got to about uh, 2005. And then from there, things started to really drift uh, south. And uh, but then you can compare that to where we were from 2012 all the way to 20 to, to 2021. And you could see that that uh, the application index, even prior to COVID, it was it was relatively flat and slightly rising. But of course, in 2021, it just balloons because rates dropped to such low levels. And look at where we are today. There are very, very low levels as far as purchase application is concerned. So it's not like all of a sudden there's easy credit and a lot of people are rushing to get these great uh, teaser rate, adjustable rate mortgages where they start off at 1%. And, uh, but then after like six months, they start rising like crazy and reset to the prevailing rate. Nobody can afford it. That's what was going on prior to the Great Recession. I mean, there was really weird junk that was going on with the the uh, kind of lending that we were experiencing before then. And you can actually see what uh, the foreclosure and inventory uh, and uh, foreclosure starts. That's what this is about. The black line are foreclosure starts and the uh, aqua color is uh, our foreclosures. And you can actually see that the number of foreclosures that we're dealing with has right now today is lower than where we were prior to the pandemic. And I'll actually demonstrate this is prior to the pandemic in 2019. You could actually see where we're at today. I draw an orange line across. You can barely see that there. Yes, it's it's higher than where we are today. That was 2019 levels. As a matter of fact, where we are today, you have to go way, way back in time in order to find uh, a lower uh, point. 
than where we are right now as far as the foreclosure inventory is concerned. And for all those people that think there's all these properties that are experiencing negative equity or close to negative equity, this is the close to negative equity is that uh, green green line, that gray area is limited equity mortgages. Those are the number that are out there. And the uh, aqua color is underwater mortgages. Underwater mortgages at such a tiny low rate. And matter of fact, if I draw a line across, you could actually see that, oh my gosh, we're at extremely low levels. And what I'm pointing to right here was in 2006, prior to the even the Great Recession starting, we saw that there was a problem with the number of people with very limited equity because they were buying homes with with very little down or no down. And so you had this phenomenon where even prior to the Great Recession, there are a lot of people that were immediately underwater if values just went down a little bit. So, or they were very close to being underwater. And they were already rising in 2006. So uh, where we're at today, pretty healthy uh, in comparison to where we were in the, in the past. And part of this issue is, uh, or part of the solution was the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010. And that was a, a big act that was put together that made it, uh, there was a lot more uh, loop, hoops that you had to go through in order to, to uh, get a loan and purchase a home. So you actually now have to qualify for loans. And they're very diligent on qualifying. That's why uh, average credit scores have gone way up. That's why people that have uh, that have good jobs are uh, have been purchasing for such a long period of time. It's not easy to get a loan any longer. As a matter of fact, this shows you how easy it's been over, uh, over time. The Mortgage Credit Availability Index, which goes back, and the history of this thing goes way, way back. And this is the Mortgage Banker Association does this. If you look at it, this shows you where we were in June of 2004 to where we were uh, just when the great recession hit, it peaked out where it was super easy to get a loan. Now you compare that to where we are today. And uh, even prior to, prior to COVID, it was actually a little bit easier to get a loan than it is right now. So you really have to qualify for a loan. And you're going to be put through all the hoops in order to, to prove that you can make the monthly payment because no bank wants it back like they did uh, during the Great Recession. So they just don't want to repeat of it. A lot of this, thanks to Dodd-Frank, there aren't that many adjustable rate mortgages that are out there. A big portion of everything that, that uh, uh, went sideways, that it was adjustable rate mortgages mortgages that adjusted on a monthly basis. There are adjustable rate mortgages out here today, but they're all pretty much fixed for five years and then they adjust the prevailing rate or seven years or even 10 year fixed. It's not like the adjustables that I've talked about that adjust every single month and no teaser rates and subprime and all that just doesn't exist. So that's what we had prior. As far as the overall housing stock, all the houses collectively put together extremely strong and you can actually see that, that they, uh, the housing stock has been built with strong credit. It's been built with uh, giant down payments as well. Uh, a great jobs. It's uh, low fixed payments, which are a hedge against rising rents and also a hedge, hedge against uh, rising inflation. It's fixed. And uh, it's, it's not like rent. It doesn't keep on, continue to go up. Record tappable equity, which means you could tap your equity and still have 20% equity in your home, which is what banks are, they'll, they'll do a loan. Uh, they have no problem with doing a loan if you have plenty of equity in your home. And that's record tappable equity that we've never seen before. We have a record equity rich, which means the number of people that own 50 uh, have 50% uh, plus equity in their home, more than half. They uh, own their home uh, close to free and clear. And there also is a record number of uh, homeowners out there that own their uh, homes free and clear. It's, it's gravitating towards 42% across the United States. It's a lot of people that if they get in pickles, it's, it's not that painful. And, and that's what you have to have. You have to have a lot of pain in order for there to be this big foreclosures and short sales that everybody is talking about that's going to happen and it's about to happen. And that's just, this is not a recipe for that. It's way too strong, the housing stock. And pretty much everybody refinanced uh, during the, uh, during the uh, right after we got into COVID in 2020, we hit 17 record lows in interest rates that started in, in March of 2020 all the way through the 17th was in January of 2021. And this is, so a lot of homeowners are just staying in their homes. They've realized rents have continued to go up, but they refinanced and they had this low rate and it's not going anywhere. 77% of the country has an interest rate at 5% or lower. 58% of the country has an interest rate at 4% or lower and 22% have an interest rate at 3% or lower. And I do California and you can add 10 
percentage points for each one of these for uh it's like it's close to is i think it's 30 percent have an interest rate at three percent or lower and it's like 85 percent have an interest rate at five percent or lower in california so across the united states there are a lot of people that are very very happy with their low fixed uh payments and they're not they're, they're not in a rush to exchange those for a uh higher uh interest rate and a higher payment and higher property taxes across the board so that's kind of keeping people hunkering down and you could actually see this this is just in southern california but the number of people that come on the uh the number of new sellers across the united states i'm actually pointing to this is 2024's line and last year beat this year it had the fewest number of homeowners that came on the market this year there's a few more but it's still it's off by 30 percent compared to that spaghetti at the top that spaghetti at the top is pretty much average on a monthly basis. It doesn't change much. There's the most homes come on the market in May. And uh, you could uh, see it's elevated through uh, July, then starts coming down. Uh, uh, so it's off 30% compared to the three-year average prior to COVID, 2017, 18, and 19. So if you compare that average, that three-year average, it's in Southern California alone missing 58,000 for sale signs. Last year alone missing about 110,000 for sale signs for the year. This is through August, so there's only four months left. So it's not going to be 110,000, but it's still going to be a lot of missing for sale signs for the year. So when you don't have as many homes on the market, you have a hard time building inventory. So you have a very, very hard time with this lopsided supply and demand. Supply remains at really low crisis levels matched up against really low demand levels because of where interest rates are at today. And that's what this tug of war has been. Supply scarcity, which favors sellers. It's gotten a little bit better this year, so buyers have been able to pull back. So affordability crisis favors buyers because values, uh, pri uh, interest rates are so much higher. But you know what? As interest rates continue to flow da float down, you're going to see more and more demand and they're not going to be able to pull back as f fast. So there's going to be this tug of war. And right now we're going to be peaking in the market. Interest rates are going to continue to slide down for the rest of the year, slowly but surely. So that's a recipe for more demand, inventory coming down for a hotter market. And that's kind of where, where the market's headed for the remainder of the year. So as far as waiting for values to come down and for the bubble to pop, that's not going to happen. You better not be waiting for values to come down or all of a sudden for you to be given a gift and you double your income. That's not what is going to happen. Uh, that's not what we, you should be uh, waiting for, not what you're rooting for. Instead, what you should be rooting for are rates to continue to slide down. The further they slide down, the better off everybody will be. And you can actually see this is where mortgage rates have, have been over time. And I'm going to show you this is actually compared to where they were all go, dating all the way back to 2006 and where they are right now today, which is uh, just a little bit less than 6.4%. And if I draw a line across you can actually see where where it is is uh, during the Great Recession levels of even prior 2006, 2008, and uh, in 2007 as well. You could actually see that that's that, that that rates were right around where they are today, and we even got higher as far as those interest rates are concerned. But the interest rates we've already established a ceiling last October at eight percent. Now we've made our way down to below six point four percent where we are presently today. And where it's going to continue to go as the overall economy slows is below that 6% threshold. And we haven't been below 6% since August of 2022. And once we get a interest rate with a handle in the fives, anything that starts with a five, you're going to see a lot more rushing uh, demand, a lot more buyers entering the market, especially come 2025 when we even have lower rates and we have limited inventory, that's going to take hold really quick. And so we can definitely see a map for getting into the fives. And that is as the economy continues to slow, which all the trend lines show exactly that. And uh, as a result, what we've heard with the Fed is the Fed is going to be making some cuts. It could be as much as this happens two weeks from uh, now. It's uh, the middle of September. You're looking at a quarter point drop or a half point drop in September. If they only go a quarter in September, they're most likely going to go a half in November. It's the day after the election. So, And then they meet one more time in December. So there's four. It's going to come down a full point. 
And uh, so that's coming, and that's kind of what's built into today's mortgage rates, but things will continue to cool uh, from here. And you can actually see, this is the spread. There's kind of this love affair that go, that's happened between the 10-year bond. That's 10-year uh, uh, bonds, uh, uh, their government issuance, and 30-year mortgage spread. So I actually look at the 10-year Treasury bonds levels on a daily basis. And there's this goes all the way back to 1972, and the average spread is 1.71. That's the average spread. And I'm showing you what that average spread is on in the middle now i'm showing you on the right hand side what the spread is right now 1.71 it's actually much higher than where it should be it's almost a full percentage point higher and that's because things are a little bit uncertain. The Fed still is doing this policy. We've had inflation, but inflation is coming back into check. And the Fed's going to start uh, ratcheting down rates to get more towards what they call the neutral rate. Well, once we arrive at that, you're actually going to see this pinching of the, uh, of the spread. That spread's going to go back towards normal. So nothing can happen. As a matter of fact, it, down the road, maybe nothing happens and the, the economy continues just to ride right along and there's, it doesn't continue to further slow but the Fed arrives closer to their, their neutral rate, you could actually see the spread fall. And when that happens, because there's an argument right now for interest rates to come down into the fives. And then once, uh, once the spread goes back to normal, you can go down a full percent. So I can, the, I can definitely see a pathway for interest rates to get all the way into the mid fours, mid to upper fours. Now that will entice a lot more demand and uh, it will definitely free up uh, the ability to afford more you, uh, that's really what the bottom line is. Values are high today. They'll continue to be high. This actually explains why I still believe it's a good time to purchase right now is because you can always, you can always refinance down the road as soon as you're, uh, as soon as you're the prevailing interest rate for the day is 1% lower than whatever the interest rate is that you have your loan. So uh, if you were to buy today and it was at 6.4% and interest rates were to get down to 5.4%, you can refinance again. And let's say hypothetically, who knows? I'm just throwing out a hypothetical, but they go down another percent. You can refinance again. You can refinance as many times as your little heart desires. So there actually is, there's your sunshine. Uh, there's your beautiful sunset. The, the, there's light at the end of this tunnel. And that basically is that interest rates are coming down to make affordability improve. And so that this unaffordability that everybody's talking about will definitely improve across the United States here in California and where we're, we're uh, that's where we have reports also in Nevada and Arizona. That's where we have reports, but it will improve everywhere across the United States. So that's why we're not going to have a bubble. It's not a bubble that's going to pop because there's a lot of homeowners that simply do not desperately have to sell. And there, we just don't see a recipe for that to happen. So Reports on housing.com is where you go to subscribe. If you liked this content, please like, subscribe. And uh, the most recent report that came out is called A Waning Market. It talked about how the market's been slowing down from the very, uh, from the, the start of, uh, from about February, March of this year to where we are today. It's been slowing and inventory levels are rising. And there's a few other nuances to this, this uh, that really explain where we are today and where things are headed from here. So uh, also you can go to reportsonhousing.com and you can subscribe to one of our many reports and utilize the coupon code bubble for a free month. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you tuning in. Hope you have a fantastic week. And of course, like always, stay cool out there and we will see you on the other side.